Yo, Abel here. If you're watching this, you probably know who Menno Henselmans is, so I won't make a huge fuss about how awesome this interview is gonna be, because you probably already know that it's gonna be good. You may or may not know who I am. If not, I'm Abel, and I interview people like Menno regularly, and I also upload educational content on topics like the one I'm interviewing Menno about. So all this is to say, just subscribe to this damn channel if you haven't already, and push that bell notification icon for more content like this. I'm interviewing Menno here about training volume, and this is the first one of a series of interviews about this topic, so you don't want to miss out on future episodes like this. And with that, let's get into the show. Could you just outline to the listeners somehow, like, just how important is training volume in your estimation if we compare it with other variables in training, such as progressing in load or proximity to failure, all of those things? Uh, absolutely paramount, I would say. Most other training variables matter because they influence volume, not because they inherently have anything, uh, any direct relationship with muscle growth. Muscle tissue primarily grows or probably exclusively grows in response to mechanical tension on the muscle fibers. And this um, mechanical tension has to have a certain magnitude, which means you need to train with a certain intensity. Uh, the weights need to be heavy enough or you need to be um, very fatigued to make a light weight produce high mechanical tension. And it needs to be of sufficient duration, which, uh, which is where volume comes in. So we need a certain amount of mechanical tension and we need to put that on the muscle fibers for a certain duration. And the duration primarily determines the magnitude of muscle growth. So in that sense, volume is by far the most important and direct relationship we have in your training volume. It's the most direct causative factor of the actual muscle growth that you're going to uh, instigate with your training program. Right. Uh, okay, so that was a very definitive answer. I like that. So um, how do you like to quantify training volume? Uh, just just let's get out of that out of the way quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are basically uh, a few ways you can define training volume. And there's actually a um, recent uh, debate about this, what the best method is, which is uh, definitely an interesting method because volume is so important. It is very useful to be able to quantify exactly what's uh, training program, how much volume that actually um, is, because there are basically three definitions currently uh, commonly in use. In exercise science, the most common definition of training volume is generally sets multiplied by repetitions multiplied by weights. So it's the total work or total tonnage lifted. However, uh, while this does a very good job in research studies of uh, equating volume between two groups, and in general, explaining volume within a certain context, at least, uh, it is in practice not very useful because you have a huge effect of exercise and training advancement. For example, if an advanced trainee does a certain exercise, they're a lot stronger and they're going to be able to do a lot more volume than an untrained individual. But they are probably going to grow less from, say, uh, an 8RM. Um, so you have a higher total tonnage lifted, but less muscle growth. So in that sense, it's not very instrumental in explaining how much muscle you're going to gain. Uh, moreover, if you're going to compare the leg press with, say, the squat, well, most would agree, and there's a lot of literature to uh, suggest based on range of motion, muscle activation, although others contested, actually, that uh, the squat is a better exercise than the leg press. At worst, they are equally effective for muscle growth. I think it's uh, pretty safe to conclude. However, for the leg press, you're going to be able to lift far more tonnage because the weights you can use are far higher. So that's where the difference between internal internal work, basically what the, the actual muscle is doing, which comes down to mechanical tension for muscle growth in the end, and external work, which is what we're measuring. So total work is very useful in research, but on an individual level in practice, not so much. So up until a few years ago, the um, paradigm was mostly that repetition volume was most important. So uh, based on Wernbaum's review, it was said, I think, 60 to 90 repetitions per workout or something uh, was the optimal volume. However, a lot of research in recent years, or, well, past decades, basically, and Compost et al. already found it in 2002, um, but now there's a pretty strong consensus that on a set-per-set -set basis, 
as long as you're training to failure or very close to failure, uh, the, the hypertrophy range, basically, this idea that you get more muscle growth in a certain repetition range, uh, appears to be, instead of like 6 to 12, it's more like 3 to 30 reps or um, 90 to 30% of 1RM. So it's actually a huge range as long as you're training close to failure. And at least in the short term, and mostly in untrained individuals, but also trained individuals according to several studies, you actually get the same amount of growth. So four sets at 60% or 40% or 80% actually result in the same growth as long as all are performed to failure. Because in the end, they probably get you to the same amount of mechanical tension in the muscle fibers, uh, which means you get the same stimulus for muscle growth, even though the weights are very different. So with that, we can simplify volume even further and just count work sets. So the amount of sets performed within, depending on what research you look at, say five repetitions to failure. Uh, those would, I cla would we classify as work sets uh, according to most people. Some might be even more lenient. Um, I generally restrict it to five reps if you're not training at least within five reps to failure. Uh, you got to seriously question what you're doing in the gym. So I think um, sets, and there's actually a recent review that concluded this as well, sets are the most practical measure um, of muscle growth. Now, importantly, you measure sets per muscle group over a certain amount of time now, because we have the Gregorian calendar. The week is the most useful me measure of time. So we are left with sets per week per muscle group as the most direct and practical measure of muscle growth. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So the number of heart sets, which which is a really practical way of quantifying training volume. Uh, so that that's what we are going to stick to here. So um, you were hinting at here and there on Facebook and in various places that your research team has been conducting a meta analysis, which was looking at the amount of training volume that uh, seems to be optimal for trained individuals. So not people who are just starting out. Uh, my question is, uh, did you actually complete this meta analysis or and if so, like what did you find? Yeah, it's not publication ready yet, but um, I've uh, presented the findings at the Human Performance Conference, the for muscle growth, the initial findings at least. Um, we haven't conducted official analyses yet. Not sure if we will actually, because I found out that James Krieger has beaten us to the punch in terms of the uh, the actual analysis with statistical significance. Uh, he found the same thing we did, pretty much. So that's good. And uh, the result is pretty much, uh, although I have a few caveats that I think James didn't uh, analyze. Uh, it's pretty much that if you look at the total literature, the dose response of training volume actually goes up to 45 sets and possibly beyond. There's really no endpoint. So it's basically the more volume you do, the better in terms of the whole literature as a whole. Now, there are a few massive caveats there. Uh, one, what we did is we analyzed it separately for untrained individuals and trained individuals. Now, this is still a very rough classification, but you can already see a hugely huge difference, a very clear difference in the trend in terms of um, if you look at the rolling average or simply just looking at the graph with the data in itself is already very uh, telling, I'd say. But if you look at the untrained individuals, the, uh, the benefits go up to about 10 sets and then it becomes really dubious. And actually the average seems to decrease slightly in the higher, very higher set volumes. Although there isn't much data, there aren't many data on uh, volumes above 20 sets. So it could be that uh, they, this data or this, this range, the super high extreme volume range basically is underrepresented and might, there might actually still be benefits, but we don't see them yet. Nevertheless, uh, it's pretty clear that there are bits and it's mostly like the, the one to 10 set range that you get very clear benefits. Now in trained individuals, it's completely different. There are actually in the, um, in the, um, just looking at the means, you can already see that there actually aren't any diminishing returns. So most research focused on diminishing returns has just lumped everything together, trained and untrained individuals. And I think that's not wise because trained individuals, they don't grow as much muscle. They don't suffer as much from muscle damage. They don't suffer as much from metabolic tension. And there's data to indicate they, they regenerate faster after their training sessions. So it's very likely that they can handle a higher training volume than an untrained individual. And indeed, in the analysis, you see that the benefits go up all the way to 45 sets, specifically in this population. So that's really where the, uh, uh, the paradigm shift, I think, right now is happening. And that uh, the, the benefits of uh, training volume go up a, bit, a fair bit higher, probably, than we previously uh, thought. 
Right. Okay. So um, James Krieger and a couple of people who were involved in conducting some of these really high volume studies uh, were always mentioning a number of caveats that probably in practice, this still doesn't mean that the more volume, the better. And you should take still take into account your individual response. And not all people will get linearly greater benefits from more and more volume. So you as someone who has coached hundreds of people and is also familiar with the literature, if someone comes to you who is, you know, has been training for a couple of years, you know, let's say if in their lifetime, they can put on, I don't know, 15 kilos of muscle, they have already put on like 10 of those or something. Where would you start out an individual like that? Um, and then, yeah, how would you progress from there? Yeah, it's probably going to be in the 10 to 30 range because I like Mike Esratel's concept of maximum recoverable volume. Um, although I probably, we both probably actually err towards a bit higher volumes now than uh, say a year ago. And uh, because of the recent research and that's mostly the, um, our advice is pretty much the, the 10 to 30 range, but the principle is that what you do is you get in as much volume as you can while st- someone can still recover from it. Now, it's probably prudent for most people, especially if you don't have a coach and you don't know what you're doing uh, precisely, then you probably want to stick to the 10 to 20 range for the most part, because uh, there are a few studies that have found negative effects of higher training volumes, even significantly detrimental effects. And those were all above 20 sets in terms of volumes. So there is certainly a strong case to be made that um, a certain part of the population will actually be off worse if they start increasing their volume above about the 20 set per week limit. And 20 is, is pretty harsh for actually if you do that for your whole body, especially if you need to fit it into only a few training sessions. So uh, at that point, you definitely get into the range where it may benefit some people. And on average, it would probably benefit a lot of people if they could do it, they could sustain it, they could psychologically give that level of effort, and they could remain injury-free. But in practice, a lot of people probably won't be able to recover from that, or they just don't have the genetics for it, or they're going to get injured, or they cannot motivate themselves uh, to train intensely with that kind of volume. And those will actually be potentially worse off with higher volumes. So there are a lot of factors that decide whether you fall into one or the other camp, and they're all related to recovery capacity. A few ones we have very good data on are whether you're training to failure, if you're using advanced training techniques and the like, Uh, probably switching in very many new novel exercises. It's also something that limits your um, work capacity in terms of uh, volume tolerance. Uh, Gender, women can handle more volume than men. Um, Energy balance, very cool study on Ramadan fasting found that Uh, Athletes were actually better off and gained strength faster if they dropped their volume about 20% during Ramadan compared to um, sticking with their original, uh, basically, bulking volume. So they actually got better results with less volume, and that's probably because their recovery capacity was limited. So the lower volume allowed them to still progress, while the higher volume basically resulted in overreaching and them not uh, being able to recover effectively from the training stress. So... Uh, right. Age is another one, uh, psych- psychological stress level, not just the, the physical stress from a training program, but also academic stress. We have research showing that can double your recovery duration. An exam week in students, for example, has been found to basically double the recovery time needed um, from certain workouts. And together, these factors basically give a, a sort of an overall picture of your recovery capacity, and that strongly determines whether you're going to be able to build more new muscle with that additional volume or if it's just going to make you overreach and uh, it's not productive volume anymore. Right. Um, So we all know and you did a great job at representing this in a kind of in a visual um, graph or or of source or chart like the factors that can influence recovery ability. So what I would be interested in is that what, what, what do you see in your coaching practice in terms of how much do you have to deviate from the theoretical optimum? So let's say you have a a reasonably trained guy and you would theoretically see that, okay, this guy would probably make the best progress on about 18 to 20 sets a week. Uh, but if this guy, let's say his optimum sleep level would be eight and a half hours a night on average, and he's sleeping about seven hours a night on average. So it's not terrible. So it's not like four hours in, instead of eight and a half hours, but it's kind of chronically, let's say an eight out of 10 recovery. Um, how much did you have to deviate from this theoretical optimum to make the best progress that that individual could make uh, in practice? Yeah, I think there's um, 
So there's basically the population average optimum we see in research. And there is uh, what, what I would call the theoretical average, what I estimate. So I actually have a calculator in my course that has all these factors and guidelines for what you set for uh, sleep quality and the like, and then it estimates an optimal training volume. And compared to that, I think the uh, deviation in practice needed is often not very large, but I would put a caveat with that that it's also very hard to measure because a lot of people, um, I think in general, you're going to be able to see when people can decrease the volume and sometimes increase. But in my experience, people that actively ask for an increase in training volume are often uh, either simply not very wise. Uh, right. For example, I have, I have some clients that in, in literally the same email, they say, uh, my shoulder's getting injured. The bench press doesn't feel good anymore. Uh, getting a bit achy uh, uh, feeling in my scapulae. Uh, and then two sentences later, I want to increase the bench press volume and uh, train my pecs more, <laughs> right? So that doesn't really uh, match those two things. And by far the most people actually go the other direction. So a lot of people will ask if they're overtraining. I get this question from at least 50% of my clients. Am I over overtraining at some point? Because I push most of my clients to the limit and they're gaining strength. Everything is going well, basically, in terms of progression. And they ask if you're overtraining. If you're gaining strength, you are by definition not overtraining because the primary definition or primary um, diagnosis criterion of overtraining is loss of strength, progressive, long-term loss of strength. So a lot of people are probably experienced what I call um, or what you could call psychological MRV or um, just, they just get injured. So I think for most people, there is a big difference in the actual volume tolerance of the muscle tissue and what they can simply psychologically sustain and what they can do without getting injured. Now, injury is something that you can definitely work around. And I think actually uh, there are a few things of becoming an advanced or elite level trainee that are extremely important and injury management is one of them because a lot of people that just do the same stuff they've been doing while they were a novice or intermediate trainee. And they, uh, for example, the classic bench press a lot, squat a lot, uh, a lot of people also still deadlift a lot. I'm not a big fan of that, but that's a different debate. And they just try to do that. They get into the research of high-frequency training and volume, and they start doing that with high-frequency, high-volume. They keep the same exercise in, and they get injured. And if there's one thing that probably 80% of the population doesn't tolerate, it is high-volume powerlifting. Basically, yeah. this actually it goes so far as to say that there are two things that make someone a good powerlifter. The first one is actually... Um, or basically a skeptical way to think of if you're going to make a good power lifter, are, do you genetically have extremely high grip strength? If not, then you're probably screwed. Uh, do you have iron joints? Because you will need them if you're going to do power lifting. And then third is, are you actually, do you actually have really good capacity, genetic capacity for strength development, uh, good insertion points on the bones, developed nervous system, that stuff. But I think for a lot of people, it's actually the case that they could, in theory, work up to, say, a 300, 350 pound bench press. But uh, in practice, they will simply get injured if they try to do so with a training volume that is also good for muscle growth. So many powerlifters, you also see this, and they basically specialize. And probably that's where the big discrepancy between strength and power or strength and muscle growth comes from. And that if you want to be the best possible bench presser, you're just going to have to sacrifice a whole lot of training volume to be able to fit in that bench pressing with that intensity and not get injured. So in practice, I really think a lot of people, um, they think they've hit their MRV, uh, but actually they're basing that on subjective indicators or injuries, and it has nothing to do with the muscle not being able to recover. Nevertheless, in practice, you do have to work with that. So as a coach, if you have a coach, then you can sort of work around that and learn uh, prehabilitation, as I call it, um, which means you basically try to prevent the injuries, knowing that you have certain weak joints. Everyone has strong weak joints, pretty much. And you have to um, take that into account, slow down the tempo, higher repetitions, blood flow restriction training, uh, eccentric overloading. These are all techniques that allow you to relatively safely overload your muscles with minimal stress on connective tissue and especially the tendons. And then you can still get that uh, volume in for muscle growth. Psychological MRV is more difficult. That is something that really comes down to motivation in terms of how, far, how much is someone willing to push uh, or just a general preference, really, of work-life balance? I mean, if someone works 12 hours a day, 
then they ju it's just not feasible for them to also spend two hours a day in the gym. So um, that's just somewhat something you have to compromise in terms of work-life balance or uh, training life balance, I guess you'd call it. Um, but yeah, I think the, the main conclusion um, is that probably theoretically, most people in terms of pure, purely their muscle tissue could handle the volume that would be expected uh, based on the scientific literature. But in practice, it's, it's going to be injuries or uh, simply effort psychologically that is the limiting factor for them to put in more volume into their program. Yeah. So uh, do you have clients uh, where, I don't know, instead of, say, I don't know, 20 sets, you had to resort to something like 12 sets or 10 sets to actually make optimal progress because um, they just, because of their lifestyle, stress level, sleep and stuff like that, they simply couldn't make good progress on the theoretically optimum training volume? Sometimes. Um, much more often, though, I found that people can increase their volume if they do so intelligently uh, compared to what they, they thought they could. And sometimes you just have to compromise if, I mean, if someone doesn't want to put in that level of effort, for example. And uh, sometimes you can get the same results, but it's extremely rare in my experience that I've seen people actually get objectively measurable better results with less volume. That really happens like way beyond the 20 set mark in research and probably uh, in practice as well. Uh, my experience is simply that you, you generally don't get there. Uh, maybe I'm just too conservative uh, with clients, but. I think in general, many people are, are going to be very reluctant to go there and it's going to be uh, quite obvious, either injury or psychologically wise, that that is not sustainable for them. So I generally don't get to that point. I think if you go from, from, 12, from 20 to 12 and you get better results, then you, if a trained individual has that, then they have very serious work to do on their general recovery capacity, probably neglecting a lot of parts of their Nutrition, because nutrition is, is huge in influencing recovery capacity. Uh, for example, not taking into account omega freeze, cholesterol intake, any of these factors other than just the macros. And um, the other explanation would probably be effort in terms of if, if people know they have to do 20 sets per week per muscle group, then a lot of people, uh, research also shows this, they, they basically hold back and they're not training nearly as hard as they would when they have. 12 sets or so. And that's probably one of the main strengths of high intensity training, I get, that a lot of people for the first time basically unlock what true training to failure is. And from then on also know that what training say one or two reps from failure is, they basically realize that they've been training like five reps to failure for most of their uh, time. And then probably you can do like 20 sets, let's say seven reps to failure, but none of those sets are going to do a lot compared to just doing one good set to failure would actually probably be preferable in that regard. Yeah. Uh, so and what would be, let's say, um, someone is making progress on a given program and let's say he's doing, I don't know, 15 sets a week and is familiar with the literature on volume and he's thinking, well, I'm making progress, which is pretty good for a trained individual to make any kind of progress usually. But let's say they think that maybe I could be making even better progress. Like, um, do you think in that, that case it is uh, viable to increase volume just in case because maybe the grass is a little bit greener somewhere or they should just be happy that they're making progress on that given amount of volume and they should be just sticking there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. And in practice, it's very difficult because uh, you, you can easily say in theory, like as long as you're progressing well, you increase the volume, you see if you're increasing, progressing better. But how do you really measure your progression? You can measure your strength progression reasonably well but research finds that the relation between volume and muscle growth is far stronger than for strength. So it's very possible to make equally good or possibly even better strength development with less volume, but muscle growth will go down the drain. And I think that is also what a lot of people experience in that they think they do just fine on low volumes, but in terms of muscle mass, like how, much, how many pounds of muscle have you really put on in the past uh, couple of months, then that's a, an entirely different question. So that's definitely something you can really only monitor, truly monitor, and objectively uh, quantify over, say, the course of three plus months and more like six to a year, generally, uh, if you really want to truly find your muscular MRV. Now, um, in practice, there are a lot of other indications you can use. I like work capacity a lot. If you see that someone's work capacity, which is, in practice, it comes down to the repetition uh, decrease across sets. So if your reps go like uh, 15, 9, 3, that would be terrible work capacity. But if they go like 15, 15, 14, 13, 13, that would be great work capacity. So 
work capacity basically measures the amount of neuromuscular fatigue because fatigue, many people have this idea that it's some vague thing, uh, some whole body, whatever. Fatigue is defined as the decrease, objective decrease in performance, so force production capacity. So the repetition drop-off across sets is basically, that is your measure of fatigue. And if you see that fatigue is not very high, then you can probably add more volume, at least for that muscle group or that exercise. Because you, you, all of this is on exercise-specific or muscle-specific basis. Because the muscle fibers respond to tension in that fiber. So it's, it actually, it's, it's, it's literally specific to the muscle fiber, even inside the muscle. Um, so work capacity is a big one. And then you have some subjective indicators that might be useful. I'm very, very skeptical of those always and always prefer to go by data. Um, and uh, injuries, of course, aches and pains, definitely an indication you do not want to train through it. And probably you ideally want to modify the training program and train around it. And reducing the volume should be an absolute last resort because yeah, just like it's kind of like the closed grip bench press. If you're doing a truly close grip bench press for the pecs because your shoulders cannot handle another bench press, I think you're much better off not benching often because it's just not a great pec exercise anymore if you're doing them with elbows fully tucked, super close grip. And it's almost like a skull crusher. So uh, I think it's much better to revise the training program, try to work around that than decreasing the volume. Because like I said, volume is the most direct link to mechanical tension, which is the direct link to muscle growth. If you're decreasing the volume, you're just directly decreasing muscle growth generally. So uh, that should be a last resort. Yeah. Um, do you also think along the same lines as, as Mike that Mike is retell that there is generally a minimum effective volume so the least amount of volume that you can still grow on and then a maximum recoverable volume that is like the most amount of or maximum adaptive volume which is like the most that you can still adapt to and then there's this MRV so uh, do you think along the same lines yes absolutely and it also goes up based on training status so if you look at the the um the graph and the meta-analysis data I've presented um then you can um, see that in untrained individuals, minimum effective volume is pretty much just uh, anything resembling a workout. Unless you're, you know, if you're on a leg extension and you're reading Shape Magazine and your definition <laughs> of heart training is having difficulty reading, then yeah, that might actually be below the minimum effective volume or, or minimum effective dose. But uh, anything re resembling remotely serious training would be effective. And then it's just a matter of uh, how much are you going to grow. However, for trained individuals, you can see that the effect sizes with low volumes are very low. So many people are going to have problem actually putting on muscle mass. Now, you can gain strength, for sure. Strength is much less sensitive to volume than muscle. But muscle mass, very difficult. And you, you see this in practice a lot. And probably the reason, main reason why powerlifters aren't as big uh, as bodybuilders and Olympic weightlifters also. Uh, but that's also because of the exercise selection. Um, so in training individuals, it becomes much more apparent and uh, you definitely want to uh, be at a certain level. I think most people will have trouble doing more than maintaining with two full body workouts a week. Uh, although on the other hand, that would be, I would classify that as super, having a super easy time. If you're just doing two workouts a week or for like an hour, you can maintain all of your muscle mass, even as a, an elite level trainee, but gaining probably not going to happen. So um there is certainly an effective minimum volume, and there's also good research actually showing in endurance trainees, unfortunately, but probably the same applies to strength, that a lot of so-called non-responders, because it is, it's very uh, well established that some people train, uh, anecdotally in particular, but also in research, a lot of people train and get absolutely zero results from their training, and more so in muscle growth even than strength. But what that study found is that those individuals are probably simply below their minimum effective volume. So if they, when they increased the volume of that population, they did start making uh, gains in endurance training performance. So that strongly supports that there is such a physiological concept. And it's not this, because some people act like uh, volume is dose response and there are diminishing returns. Uh, diminishing returns are actually questionable, like I said, based on the recent uh, data. Um, but also it's questionable if um, you're just going to get enough um, volume or tension on the muscle fibers for sufficient duration to actually get net muscle growth because it takes a certain amount of volume to instigate any adaptation and it takes a bit more to stimulate enough adaptation and protein synthesis to not just repair the tissue uh, and prevent decay pretty much, prevent detraining, but actually stimulate super compensation and get to a new level of muscle mass and maintain that uh, over time. So yes, I think I'm very strongly uh, in agreement with Mike that there is uh, not only an MRV, maximum recoverable volume, but also a minimum effective volume. 
Right. Um, and, and so off of that, my question would be, and I'm really curious what you'll say, is that um, like how much, so let's say we have an individual and the minimum effective dose for that person would be something like 10 sets and maybe the maximum amount of volume that they could cram in and still get a positive response. So theoretically, in that case, they would make the fastest progress would be 20 sets. How much, how much, how much faster? I know it's hard to put actual numbers on it, but if you had to like guess, like how much faster would you say that, that this person would progress on 20 sets as opposed to 10 if both of them are effective? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have a few avenues of uh, research um, that basically quantify this. And we have, for example, BATS meta analysis on um, training volume, which found that the actual percentage increase, where it basically doubled from about one to 10 sets. Uh, that lumped everything together, though. In my analysis, if you purely look at the average effect sizes, it's not super scientific, but I think it does actually do a very good job of just getting the, the real life practical uh, result. Then uh, actually, I can pull them up to give you the precise value. Because uh, that would actually be interesting. So in untrained individuals, it's going to be about a two-fold difference between the first, uh, between one to five and over 10. And then actually this, there's very minimal gains. Although based on the scars data we have on volumes above um, 20 sets, you could conceivably um, almost double your gains again if you went all the way up to about 35 sets. But that's based on basically one data point that pulls up that whole group a lot. So not not too much. You definitely double, double um, a bit more than double probably. Trained individuals, let's see. Uh, it's much, much more pronounced. So the effect size average of the one to five group is 0.2, which is very small by pretty much any standard. It goes up to 0.24, which is a 0 0.06 increase if you go to the five to 10 set group. Then it goes up to 0.34, which is a more than the more than the previous increase. Actually, if you go up to the 10 to 15 range, so actually ex exponential returns would that theoretically be? It's probably linear, but based, just based on the data. And then if you go all the way up to 25, because here you have fewer data points, so I group them by 10, 10 sets. You will go up to 0.36. So that's a pretty small return if you go over the 15 set range. It's uh, like 10% or so, not even actually. But here's where it gets, inter it gets interesting because there isn't as much uh, data. We have the Radeli study, the recent study by Brad Schoenfeld, and they really pull up uh, the averages of the above 30 range. And if you get that whole range together, you're actually looking at 0.47 and then the 45 sets per week groups were actually at 1.4. So in the extremist case, it would be going from 0.2. So it would be a sevenfold difference in muscle growth going up from almost no training uh, or the, the minimum effective dose pretty much to literally pushing up what is probably conceivably your actual muscular MRV. Now, more realistically, ignoring those data points, uh, although I don't see why we would, we would be looking at the 0.48, which would be a 2.5, so 250% greater uh, muscle growth going up from super low to super high training volume. So in all in all, I'd say very significant, um, but you know, still not at the level where you're looking at uh, being uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in six weeks as opposed to uh, just making good sustainable progress over the course of the years. This, uh, this will even out. So you can definitely get good results with low volume. And then you, you have to push it up a little bit more to get more advanced, to stay above the minimum volume. And over the course of years, it's, uh, you, know, you, you might be there a few years earlier, but I think you can definitely make uh, great progression with uh, lower volumes as long as you were high enough, basically. Yeah. So, so it, it's conceivable that a guy who has been training, let's say, for three years and could either like could put on let's say two kilos of muscle with a moderate amount of volume next year he could eke out maybe even five kilos uh if he pushed it up a little bit higher yeah exactly so that's basically the the, the ballpark ranges and uh, that would actually be two to five that would actually be the difference between just training at your minimum effective volume and going up to ramping it up 
very right. high. So right. purely in terms of uh, time, cost, benefit, injury risk, uh, if people don't inherently enjoy training, then uh, you can definitely make a strong case to fit almost all training below 20 sets probably for most individuals. Probably a sweet spot for people that are uh, reasonably um, interested in training, do enjoy training, but uh, don't want injuries and the like. Right. Uh, okay. So, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, now, one, one, I quickly want to touch on this 45 sets a week study. And uh, it's been belabored on the internet recently quite a bit. But to me, why this study was really fascinating is because in terms of program design, like they had these, um, you know, one group was doing five sets of squats and then five sets of leg presses and then five sets of leg extensions, all with like 90 second rest periods in between. Like that is in terms of uh, strength gains and uh, facilitating progressive overload from that standpoint. It's pretty, um, it's a pretty terrible design. I mean, I, I'm pretty shocked that they could actually make progress on something like this. And um, if, if it, like there are a couple of ways in which I would describe how this was possible. One would be that they probably didn't actually train to failure despite what the study uh, said. But um, if this is indeed true that someone could make good progress on something like this, that would mean that a lot of the things that we thought so far, for example, having high quality sets and not performing a lot of your work workload in a fatigued, acutely fatigued state, all those things are not really important as long as you're just hammering your tissues with a ton of tension. So um, does this study make you think that like volume and uh, just the sheer exposure to tension is just such a powerful stimulus that all of those other factors are just not nearly as important as we thought before? Yeah, there's a huge difference in particular between strength development, which was pretty poor in that study and not very responsive, or I think not at all in Schoenfeld's study responsive. Uh, it was in our daily study um, to uh, volume. So uh, that's also the meta-analysis. We're still working on that. So I'm a bit more tentative with the result, but we've also done it for strength. And uh, the difference seems to be that total training volume development is minimal, absolutely minimal. And probably it's because uh, the relation is almost only significant over the very long term when you're actually putting on a lot of muscle mass. And it's mostly significant at the per exercise level. So you're going to get better at squatting. Your squat 1 RM will increase faster if you do more squats. And we have a very good study on that, showing benefits all the way up to 16 sets per week, at least. And um, uh, that's well established. But if you then inc include leg extensions and hip thrusts and the like, then those are going to have a, a marginal extra increase. And especially because intensity is the key driver of strength. So you can make outstanding strength development with, say, um, actually, there is a good study on this as well. Just a daily 1RM, which many people say you can't do because of central nervous fatigue and blah, 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 but it's, it's mostly nonsense. Uh, actually, I actually have a good article on my site because probably we don't want to get into it now about uh, central nervous system fatigue myths. Um, but basically what they did is one group just did daily 1RM and had really good strength development, and the other group did that. And they also added a bunch of um, accessory work, like I think it was three sets or four sets uh, for eight reps or 12 reps basically traditional kind of bodybuilding work. And they gain a lot more muscle, but not actually significantly more strength. So there's a huge, huge difference there in terms of uh, strength and muscle growth. So I think that is that is the, the main difference. And especially if you look at that study, uh, super short rest to failure, going to failure is actually no bueno for strength because uh, technique inherently suffers and muscle activation goes down as you fail. So that is actually not uh, desirable at all. Uh, in terms of... Um, High repetitions, there's just very little to gain there with uh, strength development, as you uh, remarked. So I think that is uh, not too um, surprising, although it is somewhat surprising that there was no dose response whatsoever, because in Radeli's study that they replicated, there was. Right. Um, now, I'm, I'm curious, like, what do you make of some of these, like, uh, anecdotal uh, reports of people, like people, for example, Martin Burkan, who has always been a big advocate of low-volume training, but like, you know, not like 10 sets, but more like three to six sets a week. And um, these people have built up some crazy impressive physiques. Or even like Jeff Alberts, who is a, a, the colleague of Eric Helms, I don't think he ever exceeded like 10 to 12 sets in his training career. And he has like like a bigger natural muscularity that, than most people will ever have. Uh, do you think that these people are just freakish outliers? Or, um, or do you think that they could still get better results by upping their training volume even more? And maybe then we could talk about, you know, like some of these unrealistically high FFMIs with these people if they actually did that. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically uh, those two guys both have been training for like, what, 15 years or so, I think, at least. Yeah. So um, I think, yeah, they would have gotten there a lot faster if uh, they had trained with higher volumes. And I know Martin Burkham uh, is also trending towards higher volumes and has over time progressed towards uh, including higher training volumes. And of course, you know, it's it's very nice to sell. Like you can get this body with uh, free, uh, free 45 minute workouts per week and you don't have to do all that volume. And in general, it's always much easier to sell low volume than uh, high volume because nobody wants to hear, hey, uh, you know, it's, you, on the one hand, you can sell them. You get six pack ready in six weeks. You look awesome, whatever. And on the other hand, it's like, uh, hey, over three years of time spending two hours in the gym every day, I can get you looking reasonably good. <laughs> yeah, of course, it's not the best sales pitch. So, um, yeah, I think those anecdotes, they just say it's possible for some people. It doesn't say anything about how fast they could have done it, what would have happened if they had trained with higher volumes, and if they are just, like you say, outliers. And, of course, there is always the consideration, not saying these guys specifically, but in anecdotes in general, about whether they're on gear or not. So, yeah, I think there's not much to, uh, to tell other than that it's, it's, phys it's physically possible to get there with low volume. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. So I, I want to leave the, the people with some practical takeaways here. So if you are, um, I, I guess you interact with these guys a lot, like they have already put on a fair amount of muscle, but they probably get, are now getting to the point where they need to push things a little bit more if they want to eke out those final percentages of muscle growth, not the super, super advanced people, but you know, like the intermediate to late stage intermediate people, like, uh, what would be a good place to start like 10 to 30, uh, maybe like a reasonable point in between something like 15, 16, 18 sets, like what would be like a good point to start for the average person listening to this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's really hard to give like one figure. I mean, like I said, 15 or 10 to 30, they're, they're going to be decent ballpark figures, but it really varies so much per person, just like muscle growth rates themselves. There are a few papers that have quantified this. There's also known low versus high responder research, and it's it's really something where the, the rate of potential muscle growth and volume tolerance, they, you're literally talking about a several fold difference between different individuals, not to mention gender and the, the predictable factors. Even without the, with the predictable factors, it can still be like double. So um, I can't really fine tune it much more than it's probably going to be in the 10 to 30 range. Right. Um, but you know, conceivably, if you do everything very intelligently and you optimize recovery as well as training, then you could uh, push it up far higher even. Yeah. And then and then to hard back on something you said earlier. So like, what would be if you're not making good progress, or you're making decent progress, but it's pretty slow, like what would be some of the indications that could tell you that you should do a bit less or maybe do more? Like, uh, what, what would be some of those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, your, your rate of progression in the end is most important. So strength progression is a reasonable guideline. Uh, but taking into account that strength and hypertrophy don't correlate perfectly, uh, definitely not in fact. Work capacity is a good one. Uh, as I've said, um, the occurrence of injuries, and in particular one for program revision at least, maybe not a decrease in volume, but definitely a change in program. Um, those would definitely be the, the big ones, I'd say. And then over the long term, you can actually uh, get a somewhat uh, of an estimate of your body composition. If you're bulking, you can also get uh, somewhat of an estimate with your, your weekly percentage increase in weight. If you really ramp up the volume a lot, you see that you can push up calories higher and get uh, a bigger increase in weight without spilling over into fat gain. Uh, when cutting, it's much more difficult, however. You're really looking at, uh, to truly fine-tune that, it's going to take a couple months. Right. Perfect. Okay, so um, now now the next question is something that I'm, <laughs> like, I'm always a bit uncomfortable asking this uh, because I, like, I don't like to talk about this myself when people ask me this because uh, at the end of the day, it's irrelevant what we are doing. But um, I asked this from Mike Israel and Eric Helms simply for the reason that as guys like you who are meticulous about your training and are also very in tune with the latest scientific literature, like personally for you, like how much did you ever have to had to climb up these theoretical volume ladders to eke out the best progress that, that you had to make? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've um, had four sets a day. It's pretty much the, uh, the value that for me, I uh, was bordering on a lot of, um, beyond that point, I've actually experimented with 6, 8, and 10, 10 if, you, if you'll believe it, over the past, uh, or that was more like last year, after my show when I could do a proper bulk. I think I have actually gained a bit of muscle mass with that, that I previously thought I was at my netting max, so that's a good sign. Uh, doing a couple months of 10 sets per day per muscle group, so that would actually be 70, 70 sets. But I think the 10, I was uh, inch. 
uh, eight sets per day. That you're, you're pretty much your entire training program is designed about not getting injured. So it's not the, the most fun way to train. It's really just uh, feeling the muscle and doing lots of very different movements, extreme variety and stuff. Um, progressive overload is pretty much out the window. Uh, and strength development is as well, where it's, it's, it's marginal. Uh, eight sets a day is, is not different, but a lot more manageable. I'd say uh, eight sets is, uh, was probably close to my true muscular MRV. Then six sets was actually pretty doable, but for me, just not worth the time and uh, injury risk. I'm still definitely constantly battling around uh, aches and the like. Uh, four sets is doable, especially during a bulk. Uh, this was all during bulking, by the way, so it's, it's very uh, important to note. Uh, when cutting, I noticed that actually it's, uh, it's, it's definitely pushing it, uh, mostly in terms of injury risk. Um, and strength development certainly isn't any better if I go above about three sets per day. And currently, um, I think actually the only two ways I could conceive, or the only way I could conceivably still gain muscle mass is I think I'm pretty much at my natural maximum capacity or netty max, as you'd uh, call it, if there's such a thing. I have another article on that coming up, actually. Um, but the only way I could conceivably gain more muscle mass would be like a, a long bulk, bulking up to a pretty high fat percentage with very high volume training. And for me right now, that's not worth it, especially as the, the benefits are uh, speculative. So I'm, I'm actually at two sets per day. I'm done with most workouts in uh, about 30 minutes. And that fits me uh, very nicely at the moment. But I still train every day. So in the end, it's still 14 sets per week, which is still uh, respectable. If there's, in theory, if I can still gain, then um, I should be able to make at least a very crawl, snail-like pace of progression this way. Yeah. And and, and uh, before before these like la last one or two years of just experimenting with pushing things up crazy high, the, the stuff that got you where you are for the most part, like a 90 plus percentage of your genetic potential, was it also in the like th two to four sets range per, per session? For me, I've had definitely had phases to start with, like you're talking way back when before I was even uh, uh, known now. Um, I was actually into functional training and stuff. That's probably the sort of the, the community I was first in. And uh, I was training with pretty low volume, but that plateaued in about... Well, actually, the first year I started training as pretty much as a bro. That went really well. Both on actually gained over 20 kilos of uh, relatively lean weight because uh, I was actually really, really skinny to start with. A lot of people think uh, I had good genetics, but um, that was ev definitely not evident in my starting point, at least. I don't think I have bad genetics by any means, but uh, my starting point was pretty poor. So I went from about uh, 65 kilos, actually dropped to about 60 and then build up to about 85, uh, closing in on 90, but then I was pretty chubby. Uh, then I got into functional training and everything, worked, I think I gained a few more kilos of muscle that way, but I quite quickly plateaued, um, didn't really, um, wasn't serious enough to get to the next level. At that point, I was like solid intermediate, pretty strong, but not that big. And that lasted for a couple of years, just a lot of mistakes, uh, bulking too hard, cutting too hard. Uh, so you end up losing all of your the muscle that you built. Uh, during the cut phases, um, just not training with enough volume was probably also one of them, especially during the bulk phases. And I was probably then in the, like, maybe below 10 sets even often, certainly not over 15. And that really didn't um, do much for me. So at that point, uh, I started also getting into high frequency and stuff. And then I was probably closer to the 15 to 20 range. I've probably spent most of my time um, getting at least getting to from the intermediate to the advanced level, I spent most of my time in like the 15 to 20 range of uh, sets per week per muscle group. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and, and, and just uh, speaking of sets per session, uh, I don't know if you revise your stances on this, but like, do, how what do you think about the diminishing returns of set per, per training session? So, I don't know, is there like such a thing as doing too much beyond which you're just uh, adding more fatigue and not much more growth? So, I don't know. Is six six plus sets too much? And what what would be the lower end? Like, is one or two sets enough uh, to do per session? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, one set can actually do it. If you train every day, for example, that's seven sets per week. Uh, that might not cut it for an advanced training, but for an untrained individual or even an intermediate, that can actually work pretty well. I've had done that for some individuals. Two sets per day can actually work really well. That's that's fourteen sets per week. It feels like you're you're sort of barely training if you're used to like row splits where you're annihilating a muscle group every training session and you just have to you need a whole week to recover from that. Um, but actually, two sets a day can actually do really really well. I've done that with many clients, and it feels um, 
relatively low RPE. Research also shows this RPE is far lower than if you try to do it with a bro split. It's also very high quality volume because if you try to do all that volume, the main thing is you're adding sets, but you're not adding that much volume in terms of work. So the, uh, the time on the tension of your muscle fibers doesn't increase that much, especially if you're only counting, say, you know, the effective reps, as you could call them, uh, which are more like the, the later reps of the set. Um, because you, you're already fatigued and your repetitions decrease. So especially if you have poor work capacity, and anecdotally this appears to be the case of sprinters as well, then there is indeed yeah. um, relatively little to gain from increasing your volume on a set basis uh, above a certain point because you're so fatigued that you're just not getting in much quality work anyway. However, if you have super good work capacity, and this is I generally see this for women, there is almost no such thing as uh, a problem of adding more sets. And it's, it's really frequency is almost irrelevant because you can you can split the sets out across the week. You can do them uh, spread out every single day. Uh, as long as you get the same total volume, you get pretty much the same result. And research in general on training frequency errs in that direction. But volume is by far the most important. The frequency is probably only important insofar as it um, modulates training volume, especially if you go over about two sessions uh, per week per muscle group. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and 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 just speaking of the the quality volume that you're adding in uh, more sets that that can diminish with individuals. Like one thing I've been thinking about, and this is just just a, a very theoretical last question that I'm throwing at you is that what I've been thinking about is maybe counting the number of quote unquote effective reps, which in which is which are within that volume or a failure proximity. So maybe like four reps within failure, counting those because I guess maybe there's a difference between training one rep shy of failure and four reps shy of failure and so maybe just counting those reps that you're completing within maybe four reps within failure and counting those per week would be a, a pretty good way of going about it and then it could eliminate you know just doing a whole bunch of sets of three which is not really adding on uh, more quality volume i don't know yeah that's very um there's definitely a lot of interesting recent debates about that uh, i've also read chris Beardsley's article which you've probably read as well yeah where he yeah. argues that every set has five effective reps it doesn't matter your intensity doesn't matter as long as you do the last five reps uh, it's a very um nice model unfortunately i think it's simply not correct because it doesn't match with the literature we have on advanced training techniques at all um it doesn't explain uh, a lot of research on training to failure which finds so very often that uh, training closer to failure doesn't actually stimulate more muscle growth, or at least not more than just you would expect based on the volume. It also doesn't explain that there are actually quite some studies that find people grow uh, when they train more than five reps away from failure or about five reps away from failure. And even one study that finds that if, um, I think at their 12 RM and did its sets of seven, adding in more sets um, resulted in more uh, growth, which literally linearly. So based on that model, no set in that program would have been effective at all. So I think it's um, it's a continuum, and the later reps in the set may be more effective, but in the in the later reps, actually the last reps might not be effective anymore um, when you're actually hitting failure uh, or less effective maybe. So I think if there is such a thing, um, it would be very hard to discriminate between what the effective and the ineffective reps are. It's going to be more like, you know, the first reps count 0.2 or they count for like 20% and the last reps count 100%. And uh, you'd have to sort of weigh that. I've seen James Krieger actually try to make a model that did this, um, but um, it, I think he did an outstanding job based on the data we have, by the way. Uh, although it, it still didn't explain, I think, uh, the training to failure literature very well. But it was really um, that you are just, you're fitting the model to the data uh, and then you can get any model to look great um, with like eight parameters. But if you try to uh, let that model explain the results of a new study, then I'm, I'm very, very skeptical of how it would perform. So uh, moreover, you, you want to base a model like that on true uh, empirical literature or like and theoretical rationale. So you'd have to have some measure first, probably. Where we start here is uh, looking at Cell, cell cultures or like isolated muscle fibers or animals and actually quantifying the mechanical tension in some way and then building on that before we uh, so that we actually see like what are the effects of rest intervals for example why does adding in more rest uh, actually increase muscle growth even though it doesn't um because BRC's model also doesn't address that um adding in more uh, rest at increases total tonnage but not uh the effective reps per set if you're assuming they're five per set so 
there's still a lot of uh, problems there that I think we just don't have the, the theory about uh, to make a good model. And any model that we, we could make of that would be just you know fitting a, um, fitting the model to the data rather than devising a model that makes a theoretical sense and then seeing if it matches with the data. Yeah. Yeah. So you you still you still would think that there's a benefit of doing multiple sets of twelve to fifteen rather than doing a set of fifteen and then doing say myo reps after that or something. I think the myo reps are going to be a whole lot more time effective. That's for sure. Um, and I think also, especially if you get to a more advanced level, then uh, I think it will become re relevant to train a bit closer to failure. Like for an advanced trainee, training more than five reps away to failure, like I've said, is like uh, pretty dubious. I think. So then the BRC's model might actually start making a bit more sense um, in that, at least in the sense that, yeah, you want to train within five reps of failure, otherwise you're just not working hard enough. But um, yeah, I don't think uh, we're just not there yet. Yeah. I think in theory, it, it's actually going to be the future. Like um, the just, you know, sets are an approximation, but they're not really counting the mechanical tension. In the future, I think we will have the tools to actually quantify the amount of mechanical tension better and uh, estimate that. And we'll be talking about, yeah, and in 2018, we were still talking about reps and sets and stuff. And we, had, uh, we were still talking about these external factors rather than what actually goes on inside us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Uh, yeah, well, Menno, I think I asked you all of my questions. So uh, this was really informative. And thank you so much for doing this. So just mention where people can uh, find you and uh, check stuff out that you're up to. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm now at mentalhandsomals.com instead of Bayesian Bodybuilding. I'm just ditching uh, the brands because uh, I get basically had the epiphany of why do I even need a brand? Um, and it was just uh, um, bad for a lot of people in terms of bodybuilding, scare people off. Um, a lot, only a minority of my clients are actually competitive bodybuilders. And Bayesian was just, uh, I've had to explain it so often now and in interviews and the like, people would still like, the ba Bayesian, you were like, uh, you're from Bayesian bodybuilding, <laughs> and it didn't work. So, um, just back to my my own name, and on my site you can find everything. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under Menno Hanselmans. Oh, on Instagram, I'm actually at Menno dot because there was actually some guy that made a profile of me and actually posted my photos, uh, but it wasn't me. I actually had to double check. I was like, this this has to be something I created earlier or something. <laughs> and at first, I thought it was actually my marketing guy that did it. But uh, it was actually some Brazilian guy. So that's now been deleted, but I still can't change the link, unfortunately. Damn. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. We'll link to all of those resources. And uh, Manuel, thank you so much. This was an absolute pleasure. My pleasure, man. Nice talking. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Manuel. And if you did, then be sure to subscribe to my channel to be up to date when my next interviews with some other experts on the same topic come out. So, yeah, uh, that's all I had to say. That's an awkward finish. Uh, so, yeah, bye.